I'm going to ask you to stay standing for just a moment. Um, we've been going through the Ten Commandments over these past several weeks, and as we have um, in each of the, each day that we or each Sunday that we've done that, we've read the Ten Commandments together. So we're going to do that again. We'll we'll stay standing. Have you read them aloud? It's Exodus 20, 1 through 17. It's going to be on the screen up here, and so let's read aloud uh, together. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall honor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Amen. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. We're continuing our, our series in the Ten Commands, Commandments this morning. Uh, this morning we'll be... In uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Let's open our time in, in prayer this morning. Lord God, we come to your word this morning with humble and expectant hearts. Lord, we want to be a people of honor, and so as we consider this fifth commandment to honor father and mother, may your word be transformative in our hearts and our minds, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, let me read the fifth commandment again, verse 12 of Exodus 20. It reads, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I experienced my childhood years in the decade of the 1960s. In that decade, we saw the rise of what was called the counterculture. Phrases like question authority and don't trust anyone over 30 were common with young people. Apparently, a lot of 20-year-olds didn't realize how fast 10 years goes. <laughs> Young people were no longer encouraged to seek the wisdom of those who'd gone before them, to reject, but to reject the past, uh, the past, I should say, and chart their own path to build a, a new utopian world. Interesting enough, there was a cultural revolution of its own taking place in communist China in that same decade. One of the key ideological goals of the cultural revolution in China was to purge the culture of what they called the four olds, old ideas, old customs, old culture, and old habits of mind. They had come to the conclusion that the past and those who represented it not only should, be, should not be honored, but they actually needed to be purged, and that's what they did. Well, the fifth commandment tells a very different story. 
It requires that not only are we to give honor to those who've come before us and to those God has placed over us, but doing so comes with a promise of living well and living long in the land. And so I want to start this morning by providing some context to this command, honor your father and mother. First of all, this is the second of only two commandments that are stated in the affirmative as a call to do something rather than a prohibition against something. The Ten Commandments are often described as being laid out in these two tablets, the, the first tablet being those commandments dealing with our relationship to God, and the second table being those commandments dealing with our relationship to others. When asked what's the greatest commandment, Jesus gave this answer in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus is reiterating these two tables of the law. The first four commandments relate to loving God, and the last six relate to loving your neighbor as yourself. Thomas Watson explained the necessity of getting the first table right before you can fulfill the second, uh, with, uh, second table with these words. He said, he cannot be good in the first table that is bad in the second. In other words, our relationship to people is an indicator of our relationship to God. The first and the fifth commandments together <clears throat> reveal that right relationships start with our exclusive worship of the God who created us, and they're expressed in our relationships with those who are closest to us. What would your closest relationships reveal about your relationship with God? What about your relationship with your kids or with your life group or with your coworkers? Are those relationships filled with honor and love or are they tainted with pettiness or jealousy or bitterness? The fifth commandment tells us that the giving of honor is a reflection and a critical element of living righteously before God. And this morning, we want to answer four questions from this commandment. First of all, what is honor? What, is it, what does it look like? Where does honor start? What does honor produce? What's the fruit of honor? And how can, we, how can honor be redeemed from dishonor? Well, let's start with what honor is and, and what it looks like. The Hebrew word for honor in this commandment derives its meaning from a word implying weightiness as, as in impressiveness or importance. The role that God has ordained for parents is weighty, and we, sh we should revere that. We should hold that up with a sense of awe toward it. Children, there, there are kids I know and, and teenagers in the room today, you, you need to understand that the role of your parents in your life is ordained by God. And parents, you should see your role in your children's lives as weighty, as divinely ordained. John Calvin noted that honor requires three things, reverence, obedience, and gratitude. Reverence would be our heart attitude toward the God-ordained position of a parent. And obedience and gratitude should flow out of that reverence. I had a chance to visit the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington Cemetery a few years ago, and it really was the most impactful picture of honor that I had ever experienced. There, there's a sign as you enter the viewing area that tells you to be silent, to honor those represented by the tomb. There's an expectation that those who enter will give a silent reverence to those soldiers who died in battle, whose bodies were never identified. And everything about the, the precision with which the guards kept watch over the monument demanded honor. The moment you walked into that area, there was a sense of reverence and awe. John Frame gave this description of honor. 
He said, in Scripture, as we have seen, both sin and righteousness begin in the heart. So honor is, first of all, a heart attitude expressed, expressing reverence and respect. And so honor is a heart attitude. And so our reverence for parents should flow out of our reverence for God. Honor to parents and others is always subordinate to the honor and worship we give God, but it must be given because of the honor and worship that we give God. So what are some of the practical ways that children can show honor to their parents? One commentator suggested three things that kids can say to show honor to parents. Yes, Dad. Yes, Mom. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mom. And I'm sorry. Peter Leithart suggests four ways honoring parents should reflect how we should honor God. First is to serve them, having a posture of service. Don't just simply take from your parents. Listen to your mom and dad. Give weight to what they say. Listen to their words and their opinions and their advice. They provide for you and protect you. And so find ways to serve them to demonstrate your gratitude for who they are and what they do for you. Don't just take from them. Trust them. Trust that their rules are meant to bless you and lovingly protect you. They give you a curfew because they know that you might not have the wisdom yet to handle what happens late at night. They lovingly give you chores to help you grow in responsibility. And so be thankful to your mom and dad for giving you the tools to live a prosperous life. Obey them. Ephesians 6.1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honoring and obedience are inextricably linked together. Obedience is doing what you're asked to do without question. I think some of you as parents are negotiating often with your kids, aren't you? I often hear counting to three. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, keep my commandments after I count to three. You're just giving them three more seconds of disobedience. When your kids are negotiating with you, they're, they're, not, they're not honoring you. Don't let them negotiate their level or timing of obedience. Obedience should flow from honor, not threats. You need to make sure that your demands are honorable, for sure. But, we, but you must have an expectation that they're going to obey at the first request. Submit to their discipline. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that our sonship is affirmed through God's discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Don't, don't resist your parents' discipline. You're, res you're resisting God when you do that. You need their godly discipline to be able to learn to successfully navigate life. A lack of discipline is a lack of love. Godly discipline is an act of love. And parents, you need to make sure that your discipline is an act of love and not an act of anger. All of these things happen, and, and, and what they look like are going to change over time, right? As your kids get older, discipline should look different. As you become an adult, honoring your parents is going to look very different. But as we'll see shortly, the command doesn't go away. In our modern culture, we've established the idea of the rebellious teen years. One comedian suggested that teenagers should be locked in a room at 13 and let out again at 18. <laughs> but that's really a category that we really don't find in the Bible. Rebellion is sin at any age and should be dealt with as sin. We, we do treat our kids in their teen years differently from when they're five, because they're coming of age. And we should have growing expectations for them in personal responsibility and discipline and respect for authority. Teenagers, you need your mom and dad to help you through these years because you don't have the wisdom yet to fully navigate life on your own. And you don't get a free pass because the culture has labeled you as being in the teen years. 
To not honor your father and mother is to sin greatly against God. Disobedient children are a divisive and regressive force in the family and in society. And where they're allowed to persist in their disobedience, there's going to be chaos. And there's going to be a lack of peace. Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21 gives us a very stark reminder of how God feels about disobedience. It says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring out to the elders of his city, bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So did that passage capture your attention in any way? It should. It's meant to capture your attention. Now let me be clear that I'm not advocating that we bring back stoning. You you may feel like stoning your child at times, but I would say resist that. I don't think we're called to do that today. But the punishment that God set up for Israel was sending a message to both parents and to children and to anyone who refuses to live under any God-given authority. Disobedience and dishonor is a destructive force in individual lives and in, in families and in a society. In fact, neither a family nor a society can survive unchecked disobedience. Honor your father and your mother. So when can we stop honoring our fathers and mothers? What about adult parents? Well, as we get further into what the scope of honor entails in this commandment shortly, we're going to see that honor is for life. We don't stop honoring mom and dad at 18 or when we move out or or even when we get married. It should definitely look different as we get older. But this command of honor is for life. Scripture also tells us that when we get married, we're to leave father and mother and cling to our wife. And and so we're supposed to honor father and mother, and yet we're supposed to leave when we get married and, and cling to our spouse. Both of these things are true, and we need to navigate both of these truths wisely and biblically. As children mature and become more independent, then honor begins to transition from obedience to more of a respectful support. Married and grown children still need to honor their parents, but it has to look different than when they were under the authority of their home. And parents of married children need to respect and honor the fact that this marriage is a newly formed sphere of authority, no longer under your authority. My dad is 100 years old, lives up in, in Everett. I'm still under his command to honor, to, under this command to honor him. What it looks like for me is to, to, to make time for him, to, to visit as often as I can, to, to go to lunch or coffee with him, to, to honor his life, to elevate the good things that both he and my mom did for me and my siblings, and to, to set aside the things that weren't great recognizing that he's a sinner in need of redemption and a sufferer and a saint just like me to honor the sacrifices that he and my mom made for us. And so I still listen when he gives advice. My mother-in-law is being cared for in a home that cares for folks with dementia. How can Robin and I honor her? Um, She doesn't know who we are anymore. But Robin still visits her frequently and prays with her and sings to her. When we could get in and out of the car, we get her in and out of the car, we we took her for drives because we knew that was going to comfort her and, and calm her soul. So Robin continues to make time for her because she brought her into this world and God has called her to honor that. Part of honoring them is to take care of their physical needs as they get older, and even their financial needs if necessary. 
My dad in particular is outliving his assets. And myself and my siblings are prepared and willing to be able to help him financially as, as needed. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Timothy 5.8. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Mark chapter 7, Jesus condemns the Pharisees for denying financial aid to their parents by saying that their money was Corban or given to God. They made the excuse that, hey, this is devoted to God, and so I can't take care and help my parents. Honoring your father and mother is a command for all of life and for the whole length of your life. So where does honor start? Where does it, where does it begin? Well, as I've noted, um, honoring your father and mother is the transitional command to the second table of commands dealing with loving your neighbor. Who's the first neighbor you have when you come into this life? It's your mother and father, right? Therefore, the first priority is the family, mom and dad being the first in the family. The second table starts with honoring, and father, honoring father and mother because that's the first relationship we have in this world. Parental authority is the first form of authority that a child will experience. All authority is meant to represent God to others, but our parents are the first representatives of God to us. Honor your father and mother comes first because both love and honor start with those closest to us and build outwardly in order of priority. Kevin DeYoung said this, civilizations, societies, cultures, and countries do not flourish apart from social order, trust, and mutual respect. All of that is meant to be taught and imbibed in the incubator of the family. It's not too much to say that loving your neighbor begins with listening to mom and dad. Saying that we love everybody is really only theoretical, right? Love and honor can only be put to the test with those we actually come in contact with. How we treat the people closest to us is the most telling test of our obedience to the commands of God. I like this insight from Joel Webbin on our present day youth culture. They love love. They love the children of Uganda. They love the people of Ukraine, but they can't share the refrigerator with their college roommates. They love everybody until they meet somebody. We hear the voices shouting down injustice and inequity in the world and the virtuous declarations of love for everybody. But this hatred of injustice and love for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized for most people is theoretical at best. The real test of love and honor is with those closest to you. How are you treating those closest to you? Are you treating them justly? and honorably, and with love. It's easy to say that you love and care about the impoverished in the third world countries because it's only words. But can you love your father when he asks you to do something you don't want to do? Or when he says no to something you want? Do you speak about your mom and dad to others in a way that honors them? And parents, do you love your kids when they irritate you? Are you treating your mom and dad or your kids or those within your sphere of influence, whatever their age or whatever your age, justly and honorably? Because love and honor starts with those closest with us. It starts with the family. How we treat those closest to us is the true test of whether we believe in honor and justice and love. And so is this commandment limited to just honoring your natural father and mother? Well, historically within the church, there's been a broad application of this passage beyond simply birth parents. Many of the reformers and the Puritans included persons who are particularly gifted in some area 
and, and, and they included God-ordained authorities in the, in the family and in the church and in the sever, civic realm. And they included older people, those who've lived a long life. They are to be honored. In our youth culture, age is something to be avoided at all costs. Middle-aged and older men and women are doing things to themselves to try and take the edge off of their age and look young and hip. We don't need hip old men. We need, we need older men who value and are valued for the life experience that God's given them and the knowledge of God's word that they've gained over the years. Don't be afraid of showing your age. I'm not suggesting that we should just let ourselves go as we age, but as Christians, we ought to value the wisdom and experience that comes with age, not hide it. Proverbs 16.31 says, Gray hair is a crown of glory, is gained in a righteous life. The elderly in our society should not be discarded, but should be respected and honored. Having said that, I think in many ways my generation has brought some dishonor on themselves. They've worked for the sole purpose, many have worked for the sole purpose of getting to retirement so they can indulge their own appetites with leisure and travel, instead of seeing this time of life as an opportunity to pour into the younger generation and into the kingdom of Christ. And so I'll say this to my generation, it's easy to complain about the next generation's lack of honor, but we need to be honorable. The implications of this command to honor father and mother go far beyond just our natural parents. Throughout Scripture, we're commanded to show honor to God, to parents, to fellow believers, to leaders in the church, to civil servants. Honor applies to the home and to the church and to society and to school. As Christians, we should build a culture of honor in our families and in our churches and then bring that culture of honor for all God-given authority into all the spheres of life that we live in and do life in. Well, the Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Deuteronomy 6 version of the Fifth Commandment is, is the same as the Exodus version, except that it adds this phrase. It adds this phrase, and it, that it, will go, it may go well with you, and that it may go well with you. And, and, say, so, and so taking both versions together, that your days may be long in the land and that it may go well with you, I think we can apply this in, in a couple of ways. Um, first, this indicates that life will be full or blessed when we live a life that honors our parents and other God-given authority. And, and this is really the key to, to navigating life well. But secondly, this is a promise to God's people. They were to, to go into a land that God had given them, the promised land. And so this was, there's a corporate nature to this promise, that where the, poor, the people honor their fathers and mothers and, and where they practice godly authority and submit to God-given authority, that culture is going to last. It's going to endure. <clears throat> and so the promise given with this command applies to both individuals and, and a culture, I believe. Society has, has placed a premium on youth, uh, mainly because of image. We're an image-oriented society. Gray hair was once a sign of wisdom and experience. Now we have Grecian formula and other hair coloring options, not to supplement our character, but to improve our image. We sort of live in this contradiction where the children are desperately fighting to appear older and people, older people are desperately fighting to appear younger. Our youth are enamored and many are even enslaved to image, how they're projecting to other people. Facebook and other social media are oriented toward image, not toward character. 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 13 says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. That's what we should be helping our kids to, to go after. Love, faith, purity. 
Honoring those whom God has given authority over you, beginning with parents, comes with the promise that it will go well with you. It'll be, and it'll be expressed in your speech and in your conduct and in love and faith and purity. That's the good fruit that is going to come to you in your life when you practice honoring others. The only image of any lasting value and worth is the image of God. The Ten Commandments are about character. They're not about image. Well, honor not only brings blessing to the individual, but as I noted before, a a society that cultivates honor will be blessed also. The promise that you may live long in the land was a corporate promise to Israel that a godly respect for authority, particularly starting with parents, was the framework for a society that would endure. One commentator suggested that the design or end of this commandment is the preservation of civil order. The Apostle Paul warns specifically in Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3 that disobedience to parents is a sign of depravity and godlessness in a society. When we have a society where there's a lack of respect for authority in the family, that society is going to become chaotic and fractured. It can't sustain itself. A lack of honor for parents and the elderly is a sign of a society on the decline. God established authority to bring chaos or bring order out of chaos. The the principle of this command is not just for our natural parents, but all those given authority by God to bring order to society. Magistrates and their representatives, teachers, bosses, and others. In a very real sense, the natural family should represent the way in which the rest of society should operate. Godly authority will care for and protect those under them. It will demand discipline and adherence to a moral standard. It will defend and reward righteousness and protect against evil. Obedience to the fifth commandment demands respect and honor be given to authority. Parents and teachers and police officers, elders. In a very real sense, All of the spheres of authority should have a familial sense to them. Certainly the church and the family of God should have that, and even the civil realm or society. The the promise of this command was given to the people of Israel, that they would live long in the land that God had given them. But in Ezekiel 22.7, we read that God's judgment came upon Judah in the form of the Babylonian captivity, in part because of of disrespect to parents. It says that the people of Judah, it says of the people of Judah, father and mother are treated with contempt in you. So God had given them a land, but they didn't follow the command and their time in the land was cut short. Disobedience to parents characterizes a godless and declining society. Honor of father and mother and all of God-given authority characterizes a a society that is flourishing and is going to live long in the land and endure. What about parents and other authorities who are dishonorable? How can honor be redeemed from dishonor? Well, I'd say this, that all of us, including your kids and my kids, were born to parents who are sinful. We've all failed in some way. None of us has perfectly fulfilled the law of God. We're all lawbreakers. We're all people who've been failed by others, and we're people who have failed others. Only Christ perfectly fulfilled the fifth commandment, and he did it on our behalf Only Christ will never fail us. The only claim we have to righteousness is Christ. And so we need to rightly interpret our own stories, and we do that through Scripture and through the lens of the gospel. Even if our parents weren't great, we can seek to find the good that may be there. Some of you may have so elevated the bad that it's obliterated any hope of finding any good in your past. Maybe you've taken one or two situations or maybe one aspect of your relationship with your parents and that's become the headline 
of your story. We need to honor the past and those of us and, and, and those who went before us and, and, and those whom God has put in authority over us. This doesn't mean that we don't learn from the mistakes of the past, but we should seek to find the good and honor the good that others have done before us. I, I believe my kids would give a positive assessment of their relationship with myself and Robin, but I also hope that they learn from our mistakes. And there are things that happened in our family that if those things became the headline of their story, they could be bitter. We see in our country that the past is being denigrated. The bad from the past has been so elevated that the good is completely obscured in a way that makes those denigrating the past feel somehow superior and enlightened and self-righteous. We can do that in our families also even with our own parents when we sit in judgment of their performance. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And so because of Christ's love, we can love and honor those close to us, even in times when they're hard to love, because love covers a multitude of sins. Well, what about those who may have one or both parents who are just simply dishonorable people? Maybe there was even abuse of some type involved. I would say this, that the commands of God are absolute, but human authority is not. Parental authority, as with all human authority, is not absolute. Only God's authority is absolute. Absolute. I don't believe this command is requiring you to somehow find honor where there is none. We're not called to give honor to that which is dishonorable or despicable. We're not called to obey sinful demands, whether it's from parents or teachers or elders or husbands or rulers. God is our ultimate authority. We should honor the office of parent. Christ has empowered us through the cross to respond to dishonor with honor. And so you can honor the principles that God has laid out here in the Exodus by trusting yourself to the perfect and ultimate father. And he will empower you to become a, an honorable father or mother yourself. As a Christian, you're now part of God's redemptive story and you can now build in your own family a redemptive picture of what God intended honor to look like. You can respond to dishonor with honor and righteousness. You can speak love or truth and love to the dishonorable. Nowhere in Scripture are we told to affirm or obey instructions that go against God, but you can resist those instructions humbly and honorably and trust yourself to Christ. Romans 12, 18 through 21 gives us a picture of a Christian response to being treated dishonorably. It says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought, to what, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you're holding on to bitterness against those who may have mistreated you, then you're allowing your identity to be framed by the past rather than by Christ's redemptive work in you. And that's dishonoring to God. It's dishonoring to the God who saved you. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But I want to add this also. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 6, Do not give dogs what is holy, do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. In other words, don't give what's valuable to those who will disparage or abuse it. 
There are times and reasons to wisely hold back or even remove yourself or your kids and family from those who treat you or have treated you dishonorably. I know there are a number of things that could fall into that category, but if you find yourself in a situation like that, you need to seek counsel, seek it from the church, godly friends, and even the civil authorities as necessary. We're going to come to a close in a, in a moment here, but I want to emphasize this. No matter your background, you can build a culture of honor in your sphere of influence. Love and honor those closest to you. Ask God to help you to be honorable. You can teach your family what it looks like to honor God the Father and build a culture of honor where God has you now. You can interpret your story through the lens of the gospel and thank God that he's rescued you, not just from a bad situation, but from your own dishonoring of him. You can honor the past even when it's bad in the sense that it led you to Christ. The Ten Commandments reveal the worst in us, right? But they've led us to Christ who redeemed us from being people of dishonor to people of honor. Jesus is our perfect example of obedience to this command to honor your father and mother. In John 17, 4, Jesus said, I glorified you on earth, <clears throat> having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And so he honored the father in his heart attitude by giving him the reverence and glory that he deserved. And he honored him in practice through obedience in accomplishing the work that the father had given him to do. That work was entering humanity as a man, perfectly obeying the law of God and then submitting himself to the cross where he died and paid the penalty for our sin. Honoring God for us starts with recognizing our own disobedience and disregard for his law and then repenting of our sins and placing our faith and hope in Jesus Christ alone not on any work or merit of our own, but on the work that he accomplished on our behalf. Honoring and obeying the fifth commandment begins in the home and with those closest to us. Honor produces good fruit, a blessed life, and a society that's built on honor is going to endure. And it's only through the person of Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection that honor can be redeemed from dishonor. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that we would be a people who would honor our parents, that we would honor authority that you've established on our, for our benefit. We pray that for each of us, honor would start in our homes and with those closest to us in our own sphere of influence. And we pray for our land, Lord, that has be become filled with dishonor, that there would be a great repentance in our country and a turning to you. We know that we were among those who, were, who dishonored your name and your word, that you provided a way to be reconciled to you. And so we thank you for the work of Christ on the cross that has rescued us from our sin. And we pray that this week we would worship you alone and that we would delight in your law. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.